Greetings, everyone. Welcome to the Elm City Lit Fest podcast. I'm Ife Michelle Gardine, founder, creator of Elm City Lit Fest. Elm City Lit Fest is a celebration of literature, literary arts, and literary artists of the African diaspora. Tonight, along with me, I have my co-host <laughs> and co-coordinator, Sean McAllister. Another Sunday. Good evening. Another Sunday. And tonight, we are so excited. We're going to be talking about Black Noir. And our guests are Kenji Jasper. Christopher Chambers and Lisa D. Gray. Welcome, y'all. Hey. How doing? Hey. We're good. We're good. And we're happy to have you today, tonight, to talk about this um, genre and your work. Well, that's some real interesting work. <laughs> I don't know why I'm hearing an echo of myself. I hope that works out. Anyway, um, so first I want to ask but the three of you, how, oh, well, Kenji and Christopher, how did you get started as writers and in, in, then in this genre? You want to go first? Um, I started writing... Um, short stories really early, uh, probably in my preteens, teens. Um, Washington, D.C. was a very, very violent, complicated place at the time. And all the neighborhood heroes were not, you know, smart kids that, you know, went to school and got 3.0s like me. And I sort of took to uh, telling their stories because there weren't, at the time there wasn't anyone really writing about the street for me or for my generation. And the world just opened up from there. Um, we started almost in terms of, of professional, I guess if you want to call it that, almost around the same time. Um, about, tw you know, 20 years ago. <laughs> we're old now, 20 years ago. And um, we had a lot more hair and there wasn't no gray in it. And, there, and our faces were a little skinnier. <laughs> um, but... Um, yeah, I mean, it was just, with me, I started off doing short fiction, but I didn't even a little poetry, but I didn't really start thinking about long form stuff until around the time I met Kenji and I was trying to, you know, find a niche for myself doing, um, you know, the, the, this, was, this was during the Elin Harris explosion, you know, and all of us were, there were a bunch of us that were trying to do something a little different than the relationship uh, sort of novels. Uh, um, people were breaking off into into noir and, and and crime fiction. Some people were breaking off into more literary uh, fiction um, sort of stuff. And um, so, I mean, I think Kenji and I were in that that group. We we're trying to do something different than you know talking about you know how many girlfriends we had and writing putting that in a novel or something like that. Because a lot of people were doing that. Um, as I came to find out, that was probably a lot more popular than what we were doing, sadly. Um, but we, you know, I pressed ahead and, and you know, um, I did my first two thrillers. Uh, there were more thrillers and mysteries in Random House um, early in the, in the 2000s. And then I've been bouncing around between mysteries and pulp and stuff like that ever since. Okay, Lisa, tell us about your journey. My journey, well, I, much like these guys, you know, I started writing at a young age. I've always loved to write, um, but in terms of professional writing, um, I, I think in college I knew that that was what I wanted to do. Um, I was the editor of my school's literary journal, um, The Spellman Spotlight, and then uh, went on to, to, to continue to write short stories and to study, um, you know, to, to take classes and that kind of thing. Um, but I didn't really start to submit work until almost 20 years later. Um, and around the time I turned 45 or so, I decided I was going to quit my job and go get a master's of fine arts in creative writing. And I was going to dive into this 
um, with Ernest. Um, and so that happened in 2009-ish. And since then, so for the past almost 11 years, I've been very um, focused on one, uh, writing a novel and uh, writing short stories and getting those short stories published. Um, and so I have a collection of short stories and I have several things that appear in literary magazines. So it's been a lifelong journey, actually. Okay. Sha? Can you, hi everyone. Thank you for spending your Sunday evening with us for our last podcast of the year. Um, can you give the folks a little bit of context of what is noir and black noir so they know just kind of where we're speaking from if they don't, if they're not familiar? Uh, um, well, I mean, I, I, there, you talk to 20 different authors, you get 20 different answers. Um, have you talked to white uh, mystery or crime fiction writers or people who are writing more, you know, kind of contemplative stuff about their, their experience or their neighborhood experience? You'll get different answers there, too. A lot of it is about mood and setting and, you know, the word noir, you know, it means, means dark. I mean, and it can mean a lot of different things. It can mean stylistically dark, like you had in the those movies in the 40s that were black and white and there was a femme fatale and there were murders and everybody, everybody except the hero was, was, was some kind of jackass, you know, and, and terrible. Um, but it could also, it, it also meant, you know, a mood in say the city. Um, are you looking at my picture back here? It's like, uh, yeah, that is Trump and, and, and Vlad uh, Putin, by the way, <laughs> sorry. Uh, um, <laughs> It, uh, but it's it, it, it's a it's a mood, and it's something where you know people. It, it, there's no happy endings. You you can only only hope to come back to some kind of equilibrium. You can come some some kind of uh, where, where things are put to where it's bearable. But there's no there's no real happy ending. So it's it's a quite it, it, it it's 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 a mood, and it's a literary tool. But it's also you know a philosophy too. Um, you know, depending on what your aim is, but you know, in black noir, it, 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 you know, it could be that whole, that old detective uh, fiction kind of tool, but it could, again, it could be more of a of a of a setting and a mood. Um, and and what's great about it is you have the freedom to make it whatever you want it to be, as long as you know we're not talking about happy endings and 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 real pleasant um, circumstances for even even the hero. Uh, or a protagonist, or whatever you you want to you want to call it. So that I mean that that's just my thing. I, I would also add um, the work generally tends to deal with things that um, wouldn't be seen in light. You know, sort of within the shadows, with secrets, with uh, things that would not be discussed in mixed company. Mm. And thus, like, there's a kind of taboo uh, sexiness to the work that we do because it, we speak for those who normally don't want to be spoken for and talk about um, lives and things and interactions that definitely wouldn't go across an academic's dinner table. Mm -hmm. And thus we're kind of like, the can tend to be the bastard children of literature sometimes, but uh, we're celebrated for it too, so it all depends. And I think that I, they're one of the I think one of the misnomers when people think about noir is people ch tend to like align noir directly with mystery. And while mystery can be noir, noir is not necessarily mystery because there can be other um, genres that um, you write in the style of noir in. It could be erotica, it could be, it could be literary fiction. Um, if I look at something contemporarily like a, a Mexican Gothic, which is out right now, that while very is is very um, emulative of the gothic style of writing, as the title says, but it also has a very noir feel to it. It's very dark. It deals with these um, kind of underlying issues that we don't talk about. Um, there are lots of secrets involved. Um, so I think that you know there that when we think of noir, we tend to think of like the Maltese Falcon type of noir, but it doesn't necessarily have to live in the in the world of mystery. So how, okay. 
because I'm while you're talking, I'm thinking like over the years, like um, outside of mystery, like there was like there were things that had a mystique to like books that I read, literature that has a mystique to it. Um, uh, like you said, a darkness, a setting. <laughs> and that kind of pulls people in. Is there now like um, a more of a, what, in COVID times, the popularity of it or has it been happening over the past couple of years? Well, I, I think mm -hmm. that there has been a popularization of noir over the course of the past, I would say five to six, seven years maybe. And I think one of the reasons for that is Acacia Books noir series, which um, has um, highlights uh, various cities around the world. It's like very global. Um, and it, it, it allows writers who have some connection to a location to write these stories, these very noir stories about those locations. I think that's done a lot to kind of elevate the genre, but also I, I feel like noir has always been with us. It's not like it needed to be popularized because it's always been around. Um, and, and there are some things that we read that we may not even think of as noir, but but definitely is. I felt like for a long time, uh, and maybe not, at least for a good in the 80s going into the 90s, maybe even the early 2000s, um, there wasn't really a literary voice for hip hop as of yet. So a whole lot of noir for a good, I kind of feel like Noir, Black Noir gave birth to gangster rap, gave birth to mm -hmm. um, all those genres and subgenres, thug rap, champagne rap, all those different things. And it wasn't until 99, early 2000s, when there were a handful of, and when I say a handful, I would say, you know, Terry Woods, uh, you know, Omar Tyree, mm -hmm. uh, Solomon Jones, uh, you know, a very small graduating class. I would guess, I would venture to say under 20 people who started trying to sort of translate the hip hop world or things discussed in hip hop in a literary form and be taken seriously as a result of it. And then you had a flooding of the marketplace that happened for a good 10 years. I mean, anybody who was anybody, ex-rappers, you know, ex-strippers, everyone had their, had their, this is my street lit book. It stopped being black noir, started being street lit. And I think the counter reaction to that was what Johnny was doing with the noir books and how they've gotten so much critical acclaim and you know, technically uh, brought half of us in this conversation together in one way or the other. So, I mean, it's, um, it's a beautiful thing. I, I guess having come of age during that time, um, I celebrate its prominence and its success now. Mm -hmm. And I think as you talk about urban lit and, and about hip hop lit, that, you know, there were th those those writers who, you know, are the the kind of the the ancestors, the elders, you know, of of this genre, the guys like Chester Himes, the guys who were writing in the genre, um, you know, before it was popularized. And 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 so I want people to know that we as black writers and as a black culture have a history with the genre. It's not like we're just coming to this. Um, and that that many of the folks that Kenji just talked about, um, the groundwork for what they do was laid by guys like Donald Goins, right? Like by, by people like Ann Petrie, um, who, who were who were either writing straight noir, noir or borderline noir, because I consider like the street to be kind of borderline noir um, in terms of the way it tells the stories that it tells in the book. Um, but I think, yeah, that, that urban fiction definitely owes a lot of, of what it is and, and has become, um, owes that to, to some of those folks who were writing in the 20s, 30s, and 40s that we kind of have lost sight of um, contemporarily. Yeah, I was going to bring up um, Ann Petrie, The Street, because that does come to mind. And, you know, even... Um, Native son. <laughs> yeah, no, all, all of it, that, that Harlem Renaissance, all that work from Ellison, Wright, Petrie, Hughes, um, who am I? Forget, uh, Zora Neale Hurston, all yeah. of that work aimed to encapsulate 
all the study, it was kind of like what Upton Sinclair's The Jungle did for communism or to expose, you know, the, the Renaissance sort of put, put, painted a picture of us all, how we were living, how we were working, how we were developing. And we hadn't had that before that time in the 40s. So it was like, you sort of had the 40s, I would take a guess, I'd say going all the way through to the 70s, where you had a really, really deep, rich, rich history of, of crime noir that's touched by everyone from Ellison, who wasn't a crime author, you know, to Baraka, to uh, Clarence Cooper, to Goins, to Iceberg Slim. It's, you know, it's really, really complicated. But once again, if you look at the history of those writers, they were all writing to talk about folks that no one else cared about, you know, junkies, pimps, um, abused women, um, you know, mm -hmm. dirty cops, you know, all, everyone who you didn't want to see, everyone who wasn't pretty, everyone who wouldn't fit on a book cover, all those folks go into crime fiction. There's a, an interesting analogy would be, like you talk about Chester Himes, a lot of the stuff that he wrote before the Harlem um, detective books, I mean, it were, was kind of was this populist noir fiction. It was about life, was about, you know, like Kenji said, and like Lisa said, I mean, you know, those themes. He didn't really get into like the detective, that part of noir until the 50s. The thing is, is that when he did do that, those Coffin Ed Johnson, you know, the, the, the Cotton Comes to Harlem books, those actually started to sound more like pulp, and it, like what, what Kenji was talking about, when you had the the, the early people trying to, to to penetrate and really massage hip hop into like this noir kind of a thing, what became street lit was almost like black pulp in a way. It, it, it kind of went from noir to pulp, and pulp is more, you know, cartoonish in a way. I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to denigrate it. But it's more cartoonish, and and if you look at like even even Himes's books with Coffin Ed Johnson and Grave Digger Jones, they were they were not classic uh, noir um, that he was kind of writing when he was writing before he started writing about those guys. It was very pulpish, you know, guns blazing and naked women and people being thrown out of windows, and 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 then that kind of you know, so you 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 see that line moving. Uh, and a lot of stuff that the, the black authors do um, where, where, where things kind of take on a life of their own and they do move towards the pulpish, whether they want it to move towards the pulpish and planned it that way, or it kind of just the, the subject matter, you know, when strippers start writing uh, about, you know, capers and heists and stuff like that, you know, then maybe they planned it to be more pulpish. Maybe they didn't, but it does definitely moves in that direction. So, there's a lot of, you know, it's complicated, but you can, you know, when I think when noir uh, starts to get, um, you got to really think this through. When, noir. when everybody jumps into it and, and their mother and their grandson and everybody, and then they start doing it, it does, it, sometimes it does start to move into the cartoonish kind of realm and then it becomes pulp. And again, I'm not trying to denigrate anything. I'm just saying that when you got a lot of people jumping into it and the and the and and the tools are not something that you know you really work through and focus it has a tendency to get a little cartoonish because you have to really train yourself to understand that pulp is really a an instrument that you got to learn how to do correctly you can't just you know create a mood and then call it noir you really have to you really have to kind of massage it and understand it and a lot of times people don't and they jump into it and it just sounds it does take on this kind of comic bookish or cartoonish aspect to it. And, and, and that, that becomes pulp and pulp is a totally different genre, which is a great genre, but it's a totally different genre than what we're talking about with noir, at least in my opinion. Yeah. I, I would to add on to what Chris was saying. I would say that if you look at uh, Walter Mosley's easy Rollins and even, um, even his Socrates Fort Low, they're very, very, they're mysteries. You know, they're very soft in their approach. Like, you know, everyone rarely gets their arm cut off in a, you know, Walter Mosley thing. It's going to be beat up or there may be, it's very, it, it, I think it's much more plugged into a combination of the noir film than it is what the books tend to be like. But I feel like his success is that he captured the 40s and the 50s 
60 as, you know, as an author in a very, very beautiful, beautiful way without getting too dirty, without being, you know, I think too rugged or too popish, as Chris would say. It sounds like there's like a fine line, like when there's emceeing and then there's rap, right? Yeah. So there's like your KRS ones, there's your Rakims, there's that era of hip hop, but then you, rap isn't bad. Like there's good rappers. Like you have like your UGK, but then folks get nervous when they come in like with well, air quote mumble rap. I think there's, I think there's a lane for mumble rap, but I, <laughs> but I see what you're I'll say this. The other thing too is, is that, and uh, you guys may disagree with me, but you know, crime writers generally tend to get along and tend to socialize every once in a while in the same groups. Um, most of us all know the kinds of characters that we write about in different ways, shapes, and forms. Hey, man, you know, I grew up with some killers. I grew up with some drug dealers. You know, I, you know, I went and did a few things here and there when I wasn't being an honor roll student myself. Um, you can't help in the environment that we came out of at that time. You, you saw it, it was everywhere, you know? Um, and one of the first things I wrote, a guy handed me um, 50 rocks of crack stapled together when I was about 10 and said, well, hey, run these down the block for me. And it was more, you know, it's like, wow, this is, this. Could, I look at this, this could kill someone. But no, you know, I handed it back. I, I turned the other way. That guy who gave me those drugs was dead very soon after. And it's kind of like you, the reality of that, of life and death, of crime and punishment, of people going into jail, people coming home, all those things are part of the genre because it means to explain the places where the general population doesn't go or is afraid to go or wants to know a way into, but they don't want to get killed or get imprisoned, you know, to do it. So we're, we're kind of, it's a very escapist culture, I'll say that. It's like you're reporting live. Exactly. And, and I think, you know, as writers, we make these decisions, right, about how we want to tell these stories. Um, but And there are lots of options, right, for how you, you convey this idea that you have and, and this world that you want to create you have a plethora, a host of different genre to choose from, but you want to pick the one that is most true to the core of what it is, the story that you're telling. And I think that, you know, for some of the stories that we write, that th there is there is this gritty, harsh underbelly to it, which lends itself very well to the genre of noir. Right. There's kind of like always going to be these people in in the in the universe of the main character or or the friends of the main characters that um, are reflective of many of the places that we that we come from. And unfortunately, a lot of the times there are, you know, there's the neighborhood drug dealer. There's the neighborhood crack house. There's you know, there's the guys who hang out on the corner every day. Um, you know, there are these elements of our lives that I think um, lend themselves to storytelling using the, the, the tools and the, um, the, the tropes, for lack of better terminology, of what noir is and how noir functions. And let me just say one quick thing. I, I also think that she sort of, you know, Lisa sort of said, well, unfortunately, you know, it's the local drug dealer. And I think some of the best work makes the local drug dealer a hero or an interesting source of information or um, someone with an anecdote that has nothing to do with the fact that he sells drugs. Maybe he's annoyed with the price of detergent in the supermarket. You know, maybe he's really pissed that his team isn't doing so well and goes extra lengths to it. We're human beings. Yeah. You know, we do time. You know, hey, we end up in handcuffs. Hey, we harm we harm people, but that doesn't make us less of human beings. These are our stories. Respect them, et cetera, et cetera. Yep. Like, so, and I, I guess uh, what I, the really what I want to say is like the unlikely hero. It's not the guy yeah. who you expect to be the hero, right? 
It's not the person that typically becomes the hero in the stories that we see in uh, straight fiction or, or literary fiction. It's also yeah. I mean, a lot of times you'll see um, if you if 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 you're gonna if you're gonna create the grittiness out of thin air, you know, then it's not you know if you're gonna have a drug dealer. You know, as Kenji said, it, it, the the point is to show him as a human being or show her as a human being, not as like a superhero or a supervillain. You know, they're not Thanos or they're not some, you know, or they're not some rat crawling around in the sewer. They're a human and there's a human story there. And that's what that's what noir does. It doesn't it does it doesn't vilify people or put people on a pedestal that that either do, you know, maybe we've put on pedestals before, or maybe we want to see them put on pedestals. It just, it shows their truth really, you know, and if you can do that, um, you know, in the context of this, you know, that, that sometimes things are bleak, then that's what, you know, that's what noir is about. I mean, I don't think anybody, you know, wants to limit it now to just crime fiction because it it, it is spilled over, in terms of a tool and 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 into and, and, and even historical uh, fiction, even even in nonfiction um, um, personal memoirs, I mean, it, you know, because if 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 that's the flavor of the memoir, that's the flavor of the memoir. So you know, it is everywhere, and I think you know, and I think that we're doing it more. Um, it seems like we're doing it more because our voices are being heard more because we have moved away from the Maltese Falcon type. And fifties or forties movie uh, trope, uh, and, and shown that you know black noir is is, is infused in everything, and I, and um, I mean that's that's how I like to look at it. And when I look at my, when I do my stuff is more towards the traditional definition of the word, but I still want to inject what my opinion is about how it's more universal in terms of black black writers. But I mean, but just that my specific work is more crime fiction. But <clears throat> excuse me, that doesn't mean it, that that I go crazy the way like you know you say some majority white writers might go crazy when they see uh, noir being used as a tool uh, in in other in other genres by by people of color. I mean, you know, they that, that's that's something that we wrestle with all the time as writers with, with our our white peers. Uh, either in a specific genre or out of it, you know, we're always the ones who are, um, we're the, we're, the, we're always the iconoclasts. We're always the rebels, the troublemakers, you know? Well, yeah, but it's because, you know, yeah. 400, 500 years of bullshit. That's why, you know, that's why, you know, so we are the iconoclasts and the rebels and we push the envelope. You're seeing that now um, um, in, 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 in my specific genre, <clears throat> of of mysteries uh, where a lot of, of white traditional writers are 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 kind of upset because people of color, particularly women of color, are pushing the envelope of mystery and crime writing and and noir and, and you know and, and black noir, Latina noir, you know, and and are, even in these cozies where the cat kills some the butler has now been turned around by women of color. Where it's you know just an ordinary woman who's a single mother, and she becomes a detective. It's not some rich white woman in a, in a tea parlor anymore. So even that little subgenre of they call them cozies, like murder she wrote, women of color have totally turned that on its ear, and if, by injecting that black noir kind of thing into it, and you know it it, it makes some of the majority writers you know uh, you know they get they get all shaky. Because you know it, it destroys their 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 pre uh, predetermined notion of what noir is, and it shows that you know we've taken it and and made it our own because it always has been our own. Are you muted? Forgot. Um, I would also say that um, because and please correct me if I'm wrong, but um you know, what black folks never had, and not for a long time, we had Easy Rollins, never had really over the last, over the course of my youth, was there was never like the the cool black detective that solved crimes and just did that. It was like a guy that was like, you know, was the garbage man and there was the episode where he figured something out, 
you know, or he was, you know, the the store clerk has to figure out why all the napkins are missing and some guys are running a napkin hustle out the back or whatever it is. But we didn't have like like a Jessica Fletcher, you know, or a Joan Wilder or any of those folks to say, hey, you know, I want to watch a mystery show or I want to write a mystery. I feel like most crime, most folks who who have done crime fiction learned it from other cultures or others, and then incorporated what we knew back in the black culture. You know, I mean, there are certain certain things to take from the whether it's Chandler or Hammett or um, God, a ton of people. Tony Morrison does a lot of really good war yeah. She she does, she does violence really really well. She's uh, Charles Johnson does violence really, really well. Like, yeah, it was, it's all it's all about you know all we've had were like was more on the pulp side of it. We had right. John Shaft, you know, um, the the parts that the original movie Shaft. I'm not talking about the book, but the movie. The parts that I liked the most were the parts where he wasn't busting through windows or having sex with people, you know, or shooting them in like the head. Him. It was it was him walking the streets and working the leads yeah. and talking to people and leaning on informants and beating up, you know, somebody who's trying to be, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't the, 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 the gunfire and the booty. It was, you know, but that's how it, that's how it kind of, it, it, it kind of um, evolved. And, you know, and, and for a while, that's all we really had. Mm -hmm. And, and I think you get in, in those things that you just talked about or those kind of those moments that you just talked about, right. Um, one, there's the, the, there is that that whole um, kind of uh, lineage or, or or group grouping of these black black exploitation films, right? That are very immersed in what noir is, and you get guys like Hammer, like you just said, Shaft, right? And then we, I think, on the 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 larger society wants us to believe that that's the story. That, that is the story, right? But the ability of, of other writers who are writing in the genre to be able to find that intimacy with those characters. And I think that's what you're talking about, Chris, is that we're able to, to see their humanity, as someone else mentioned earlier, and we, and we get to have an intimate moment with these folks as they're having these kind of conversations with themselves. And and we can see the evolution of them. They're not like these flat characters, right? right? They they have a larger life that that this um, that we're able to kind of get a window into as they tell their stories. I think black writers can do that and add that humanity because you've seen it. Everything you're describing, like if you grew up in a Newark or a New Haven or a Chicago, these things are natural in the sense you very you see many unlikely heroes like that whether it's pims drug dealers folks just on the corner folks boosting these are still people and they these are the stories that i feel like as you said they aren't mainstream but if this was your main if this was majority of your life this is for some this is all you know this is all you've seen so i think you guys are really reporting live from that flip side of that coin and i think others may get shaky who aren't um, who aren't black because you got you kind of got to make that up if you wasn't there. If you wasn't there, if you don't know about it, if you haven't experienced it in some degree or can relate to someone else, then you're kind of writing off of what you think happened or how you would feel. And you you can't make that up. You had you literally have to be there. <laughs> Let me um, just add this. I mean, there's another aspect to this: is that noir black noir works best. In, in my opinion, in, in these settings where you have these disparities, it, 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 you know, it'll work in New Haven because you've got white Yale there. It'll work in New York because you've got Manhattan, you know, Manny Hanny and everything that's rich about it. But you've got poverty, you know, it'll work in Baltimore and work in D.C. for the same reason. L.A., San Francisco. It seems to work better, in my opinion, in, in mostly in, a, in an urban area, but there are a lot of writers out here knocking it out right now uh, in terms of, um, of, of the South and, and rural kind of stuff. But it, it seems to me personally, it works better when you have uh, these characters existing where there's another universe, right, literally right across the street maybe. 
Right. Um, so I just wanted to just throw that out there to see if anybody agreed with me. I, I do agree with that because then what you get, the 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 setting becomes right. character. Right? The setting is not there just to be a place where these things happen. The setting becomes a, an integral part of the story and we get to see that juxtaposition, that disparity um, as it's lived by the characters themselves but also as we talk about this place, right? So, so, so I think that, that I do agree with you on that and that the cities that you talk about are cities that in and of themselves bring something to the table, right? There's, there's, there's a there there in terms of that, yeah. And it, it's also, you know, in the literature, it's also a beautiful way to kind of break down how we communicate in cities. Not to say that there isn't plenty of crime lit that doesn't take place in cities, uh, but given that the police have one way of doing things, you know, we follow through crime fiction because it's always a very different approach. You know, um, a dead body signifies much more than a crime, you know, depending on where the person is found, you know, how they're killed, who were they? You know, um, you know, what kind of gun were they killed with? Who did that gun belong to? There are all these different ways to, tr to trace evidence and custody and history and backstory, usually by, by traveling to places that you wouldn't expect, whether it's the Chinese carry out, you know, whether it's the laundromat, whether it's the local brothel, you know, local bodega, every place is a set piece. And just like Shah was saying, you know, I, I feel like the best of us writers know how to just transform that neighborhood into a world that readers want to come back to every time because they continue to get something different each time. And I want to say historically, I feel like Oscar Micheaux's films did it very well. Like I can't think of any name of any specific film I was like going through my brain, but I used to like watch a lot of Oscar Micheaux films and like, and and a lot of his films are about people committing crimes, but there was there was li their lives were happening. And there was a reason behind it, right. like it wasn't just random. And it was a real look into uh, black life at that and, time. And that's the other thing: so much of black culture and black life was illegal. You know, we you know the speakeasies we had. You know, the way that goods came into the community. None of that was legit, man. You know, pre-Jim Crow back then, man, you know, you had to get things whichever way you were going to get them. You know, and there was no, I don't feel like there would be the same level of judgment about it now because, hey, you know, you're one or two generations away from, you know, the moonshine still in the country, you know, and that being big business that moved the family from the country into the city, you know, is a hustle he did once. Next thing you know, maybe it's cigarettes, you know, maybe it's dinners, maybe it's weed, you know, maybe it's sticking people up. Whatever it is, it's about feeding miles and telling that story in a way where you love the people who are committing the crimes. You know, either they're funny, they're interesting, you can relate to what's happening to them, but whatever it is, you're magnetized to it despite the fact that it's potentially naughty and dirty. I think that's the beauty of the genre. So tell us about some of you all's work. We have about 20 minutes left. We've been chatting it up and giving context, but tell the people what you have going on. Okay, I'll, I'll go first. <laughs> um, I started a series character uh, called Kango Watts in this my most recent novel, Notion Avenue, um, which was started by, ironically, a short story called Thursday in Brooklyn Noir, which, uh, which uh, Lisa was mentioning. And I came back to that story and, you know, built a narrative around a character that I had written when he was in his 20s now, um, in his 40s, in a very different place. And I just threw all the, all the rules out the window. I mean, you know, there's magic, there's political campaigns, there's real life people that just show up for no apparent reason. I think what I wanted to do was to instead say, well, hey, I wrote a crime book, you know, read my crime book. I wanted to be able to take any any reader and bring them into the world I was creating and, and um, 
hopefully, you know, that they would hopefully enjoy themselves. And I have to do it, Chris. I'm sorry. I have to do it. Um, we we had a really great pandemic writing group for a while. And Chris gave me one of the greatest comment, compliments ever, you know, because he really loved the, the second person style that I wrote this book in. And it meant it meant like everything to me that I got that compliment from him. So um, I just try to I try to push forward. You know, I try to push forward and, you know, seduce when I have to. It, it's it's funny because um, when um, George Pelicanos was on the radio um, and he mentioned he mentioned and, you and he mentioned me and I actually uh, called in and I and I said, you know, I got the second person idea from you. So there was, you know, there's all this cross pollination there. That some of these other people weren't even talking about. So that's all I cared about was like, okay, <laughs> you mentioned Kenji, you mentioned me. We're cool. You know, it's like having your dad on the radio calling you and say, hey. Yeah, and like I said, I, you know, I, you know, to, to, to the chagrin of both Ifa and Sha, I mean, we, the three of us have been like hanging out every Saturday night for months. So there's a kind of there, you know, there's a kind of rapport that we develop as writers, and I also think trust that most of the time groups of writers just don't have, because I mean we're generating new stuff every week or reading old stuff or getting critiques and um, you know definitely keeping what we do alive. Um, and I and just just for my moment of praise, man, you know, uh, Lisa is the best at just dropping into a character that you don't expect. And not only make them likable, but make them extremely engaging. Like she just possesses like the puppet, and it becomes mm -hmm. like four dimensional and dances around, and uh, and you just you you can't you can't you don't want to get off the ride. You know, Chris is like a scholar in that he breaks down everything in the environment. You know, he's gonna tell you what the toilet paper is like. You know, <laughs> he's gonna tell you if the numbers are crooked on the building, whatever it is. Like Chris is a master of detail. All of our approaches, you know, I'll probably start off with some, you know, some weird food recipe or some conversation about domestic problems between like a drug dealer and like, you know, a shopkeeper, whatever it is. Like we all have our, our different approaches, but you don't get into this work if you don't love it, you know, and you don't stay there because you want to make money. You want to be a bestseller. Nah, man, like, you know, um, we're, you know, we're the, we're the recluses genre. You know, like they, they had us the awards last. So, you know, um, anyway, I mean, you know, I, I really dig what we do. Yeah, I um my latest is is um scavenger, let me put it this. Um this came out in October and um it is a mystery. It even says mystery. <laughs> um and it is it is um it got a lot of um notice because my protagonist is 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 uh started off as a homeless uh uh spice smoker homeless addict in washington dc and he's basically forced to become uh, a sleuth uh and you know and i try to mi mix a lot of the noir tools into that um so it, it it sounds like it's breaking a lot of rules but it really isn't because it's following kind of a black noir uh pattern um, but as 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 we we said, I mean, I I when I saw Kenji's book, uh, Nostrand Avenue, and I saw that second person narrative where you know you're reading it and and it's not I I walk through a door or he walked through a door, but you walk through the door. Be careful what you see around the corner. So it's almost there's another character talking. So you get two for the price of one, and it it it. Um, it um, you know it's definitely difficult, but it's something you know. When I saw him do it uh, so masterfully, I said, you know, this is I have to do it this way because I have a character who, in and of himself, starts off, you know, as a lot of homeless people do, hearing things. So what? What? Why not use that second person narrative where it's almost like a voice in his head uh, moving the story forward? So um, you know. That's, but that's still part of black noir. I mean, you know, because, you know, he's somebody whose circumstances uh, are something that maybe people in the majority not would not only just ignore, but may even despise. A lot of people on the street, you, you, you despise them. Um, 
or think that you know they're dirty or or they don't have a story you know even even if you on the surface you know um look at them and 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 you know uh, empathize on some level then you go about your day and you know and and um i wanted to show you know somebody kind of moving beyond that and 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 into uh you know a real noir story so that's 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 what i did that's that's scavenger. It's easy to remember the name. <laughs> and I'm kind of like the newbie in the genre. Um, so I, I I actually didn't even consider myself to really be a, a writer of noir until somebody asked me to submit something to a to one of the noir series books. Um, this one, uh, New Haven Noir, which is about New Haven. Um, and I think I'm I'm the one who writes noir that is not based in mystery, right? Because the story that appears in this book um is not necessarily a mystery story, but it the the protagonist is um a a, a recovering addict who um is is attempting to to right some wrongs in her past. Um, and, and keeps getting hemmed up. You just can't seem to get it right. And it's interesting that you're talking about second person because uh, the protagonist's voice in this story is all in second person. It's all, to and, and it's because I, I wanted to get kind of that that feeling of disassociativeness of the drug addict and and the drug addict in recovery who is still kind of has these tendencies sometimes but and, and needs to have a conversation with self as they're kind of navigating through life. Um, and so I, I don't necessarily consider myself to be a, a writer of mystery noir, but the things that I'm working on right now do um, contain elements of noir. Uh, my novel is called uh, Stolen Summer and it's a work in progress. And it follows some young women in 1963 Georgia who are dealing with being held captive by the police for about 30 days without benefit of charges. Um, and so it really looks at like, what, what does it mean to be a woman in the civil rights movement? What does it mean to be a young girl in the civil rights movement? And what are the stories, the secrets that we don't necessarily hear about on the front side of that, 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 um, that history and the stories that were typically told about what happened during that time? Um, so I, I, and which is why when I talk about noir as not always being um, based in, in mystery and or not always being about the the crime drama is because I feel like I, I do write noir, but I don't necessarily use mystery as the vehicle for that. So when you just spoke about what you're working on, about it being in Georgia and like young women being captive, would you all consider beloved noir? Definitely. Um, I think that People don't want to consider it noir, strangely enough, probably because it, it won a Nobel Prize and it's this highly acclaimed piece of work. And um, it deals with slavery and it deals with all these other deep topics that overshadow what the plot of the book is. Uh, because the actual, I mean, not, not only is it noirish, but it's also completely supernatural. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's a beautiful piece. I definitely think, like I said, Toni Moore is a new to street man. You know, she, you could tell as, as a kid growing up, like she saw some things and remembered those things and her feelings about, you know, men as lost, you know, or men as sacrifice, you know, men as villain. I mean, I, I, I guess the thing is, is that you see so many things in communities of color growing up and to be able to articulate those things and capture them in a, three-dimensional, four-dimensional thing, way is everything, you know? And only the best writers can really do that. So I, I can, Tony Morrison, definitely noir. Yeah, I mean, it's, and, that, and scene, I, that, that scene in Jazz where, where, uh, where the mother stabs the, the corpse in the, in the casket, that was like the most gangster thing I ever read. Ever, 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 ever. Oh, ever. Man, yeah. like, and I, I gonna, the next thing I was going to say was that I feel like beloved, yes, but 
Jazz. Yeah. Jazz is her novel that really takes elements of noir and, and you can like taste them, feel them, see them, right? They're like right there in your face in jazz, right? Yeah. Yeah, she's, I mean, jazz per is perfect. I think, I think, but when, when you're talking about Beloved, that just shows how much of, of a giant that she is because she could take noir and gothic horror and historical fiction because a lot of the, the, the story was based on a real uh, right. case exactly. um, and pu and pushed them all together. And, you know, uh, most writers can't do that. It, it, it's, right. it, it'll start to sound either pulpish or just crazy. And she, she did it. And and not only did it work, but it was masterful, you know. But I will say, but for strict noir, yeah, jazz, uh, definitely, definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. This is so fun. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> Y'all just like take it away. It's so this is wonderful. No, I mean, like, I mean. like I said, I mean, just because I know that I've had various points where I was, you know, everyone gets frustrated as a writer, man. You know, and nothing. Very, very rarely do things look great when you're looking at them on the screen, even when you're finished. You know, it, at least for me, on a good day, on the best day, it's like, yeah, okay, that was all right. You know, let me, like, sit that over here and pat myself on the back. Then I'm going to, like, shower and shave after my, like, 72-hour run at this thing and then go back and look at it again. It's like, uh, I don't know. And usually who rescues you are your either your writer friends or your reader friends who come in and have to sort of either pull you away from the keyboard or tell you, hey, you know, this is dope. Hey, this works. You know, hey, I want to read more about this. And it's like, OK. All right. Well, so I'm not like just neurotic artists. Like I'm actually kind of like getting. It. OK, good. Make a note of that. Stick a pin in that. Let me go over here and deal with these outlines like it's it's. It's a really weird brain space because you're kind of jumping between right and left and back and forth and looping all around the place. And um, any creative work is like an obsession. But when you're either talking about a, uh, solving a crime, or really, I kind of feel like the best noir is the is the actual commission of crimes. You really, really, really get the sense of what people under pressure will do. And, and you get to understand that anyone. Everyone is capable of anything, right? If you're put in the right circumstances, right, then then you you will you will kill. You will do things in order that you probably would might say, I would never do that. But if you're pushed to the brink, sure you would. Yeah. And the thing is, historically for black people, we the way we've had to live, like like I was saying, like how Oscar Michelle put it so brilliantly in his films um, about everyday life, but also having that like survival hustle oppression is there, you know, and it, 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 it's permeated for like 400 years and still, and still today, even in, in COVID times, there's people out here doing some stuff they never thought they would have to do because mm -hmm. they lost their job. And their cousin said, look, I got this happening over here. <laughs> or even, yeah. And it yeah. speaks to like that hustle, what the hustle culture looked like. I think some of my favorite, some of my favorite like mystery noir books are about the hustle. Like, you know, I got a I got a day job, but I got a hustle. And and it gets to the get down when we get into the hustle, right? right. Yeah, and don't let nobody get in your way, because then there's always that person. There's somebody that get in the way that may be a casualty or not. <laughs> <laughs> right? Who will you take? Out? You you get you learn real fast. Who am I willing to take out in order to get where I need to be? You know, it's it's, it's funny. I'm I'm probably gonna in, in my next chapter in my, of of work. I'm probably gonna kill a lot more people. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I said a nice guy, you know, before. So. <laughs> I remember. But, you know, it, we, we have a lot of, of freedom, you know, to do that in, in this, using noir as a tool. I mean, um, because I, I got, a, as a personal matter, the only writers that I don't really get along with that well are the writers who probably are writing 
um, in another medium, probably television, because they're in a room with a bunch of egos and a bunch of, uh, you know, all kinds of weird stuff going on in a writer's room. And they don't have that solitary uh, experience of trying to create a universe. They're, they're basically creating a product. And I get along with all kinds of people in all kinds of genres, poets, everything, but writers that write for like TV that sit in a room with each other, you know, putting, you know, it, it, it there's, I never seem to connect with them and I don't, and a lot of them are nice people, but I never could connect with them because, because of, of my solitary experience. In defense of them, I'll just say that dramatic writing by genre, you know, requires so much input from so many other people. You know, like if you're talking about what you say, hey, I write for television, okay, that means that you work with a team of somewhere between six and 12 other people who are looking at everything that you do from the top of the company on down because they're investing a million dollars per episode in what's being produced. And that means that the folks who are writing the check have a say. When you, when you have the ability of being in the room and it's just a keyboard and it's you and you don't have an EP breathing down your neck, you know, or a board of directors or, you know, all those other things. What's hot, you know, what's big, who's the star. Star might not be able to act the way out of the paper bag, but they got the numbers, so we got to deal with them butchering dialogue, you know, or whatever it is. I'll just say that the beauty of the creative process, which is what we're here to talk about, is that we do it all here. We're one-stop shops, you know. We, we create we process, we edit, we manufacture, we get it out there, you know, and whoever's going to read it, they got to take the time to get through a couple hundred pages of the work to say, wow, I finished that story and I knew, and I know everything about these people. And Doing that television, you need like 10 seasons. <laughs> okay. We got three minutes left. I want to, I want to thank you all. If you have last words real quick. <laughs> I just have to say thank you. This has been beautiful, and, and we got to do it again. Oh, That's absolutely. <laughs> yes, yeah, absolutely. And when next time we come back, we'll have you all read all from right. your work. Okay. And um, I, we, we just really appreciate you all coming through. I want you to have a happy and safe holiday season in life. Like, man, we got there's some noir coming out of this just COVID cooped up times, right? Right. <laughs> and, oh, and follow us on Instagram at Kenji Jasper, at Prof C. What are you, Lisa? I am <laughs> at Random Lisa SF, and I'm at O-V-O-S-S-F, which is the literary reading series that I do um, produce and have been doing for about the past six or seven years. And it very specifically is a way to elevate and amplify the voices of women writers of color, we are going virtual in 2021. So go to OVOSS, OVOSSF on Instagram and Twitter. And our voices, our stories, sf.com is our website. Please check us out. And she, there she Chris, Chris but you got social media? What's happening? Oh, yeah. Yeah. He said it uh, on Instagram. It's at Prof Chris. Okay. So we got one minute left. We're also going to put all that information in on our Facebook page, which has been broadcasting this live. There's been a couple of watch parties going on. A lot of folks tuning in. Beautiful. So you'll be able to go to Elm City Lit Fest on Facebook and share it. Our Baobab Tree Studios. We want to thank Rev Kev for holding us down here. Yeah. And, and we're going to uh, peace out. We do want to remind people uh, the next event for Elm City Lit Fest is we are busting out of 2020. We're going to have a virtual New Year's Eve celebration. We are encouraging everybody busting out of 2020, envisioning 2021. So everybody like at home sure. can vision board together. Sure. <laughs> Look, with the party us. that you wanted to go to where you thought you was going to wear that fit too that's been in your closet. This is This is where you need to wear it to. Yes, it will be in your house. Yes, you just will get dressed up in your house to go nowhere because you got to bring the energy in the house. You cannot go outside. So if you're going to be in a house, you might as well be in the house with us. We're going to have a live, we're going to have a DJ streaming in live from a party. 
this can, we're back to connect connecting we're this gonna have the pot, New Haven. Someone's actually having a party. You said like, yeah, she's gonna her 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 pod is is she's gonna be doing it. Oh, okay. Live okay. DJ from her 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 party, her personal little thing. And then we have the New Haven Pride Center. We have Cultured as Fuck from New London. Mm -hmm. Good. They're going to have performances, Influence of Life, and Poets Realm in Bridgeport. We are connecting this Connecticut. Yeah, John the Connecticut. Violinist, like, come through. Like, you, you have nowhere else to go. And John the Violinist is going to be playing back that thing up on the violin. Okay? Oh, like, come on now. <laughs> I'm so excited about this. <laughs> so we want to thank everyone for joining us on the Elm City Lit Fest. Blessings, and we are out. <laughs> Take care.